Hello, good evening, and welcome. This is our regular Board of Education meeting. Uh, tonight is October 21st, our last meeting in October. I'd like to welcome everyone, um, and we'll start with the administrative reports and the chairman's corner. Um, I'm Melissa Migliaccio, I'm the chair of the Board of Education, and um, just a few reports out. I'd like to thank our tech team. I know members of the public who have joined previously through Zoom have had, we've had challenges um, as we navigate this new way to hold public meetings. Hi, Brandon. Um, so I'd like to thank John Lambert um, and um, the other John um, for setting us up. We now, this is our Zoom speaker, so when we have members of the public attending via Zoom, that's what we'll hear them on. Board members, the um, speakers on the floor are to pick up our voices as we project, and then these speakers are projecting out um, as well. So thanks to the tech department um, for setting us up and, and continuing to adapt with us. Um, opening remarks, other than um, a big thank you again to our teachers, administrators, everybody, custodians, bus drivers, nurses, um, secretaries. We just are about to finish in Granby our fifth full week of in-person learning, and it has been a big task, um, and thank you everyone for making this happen. Um, and with that said, I will turn it over to Dr. Grossman for superintendent's announcements. Super, thank you, Mrs. Migliaccio. Number one, I wanna welcome everyone tonight, and I wanna give our special welcome to our middle school staff and our students here for coming out after a long day of school and joining us tonight. We're very excited to hear you. I want to let everybody know, the community know and the board know that we are celebrating our bus drivers this week in Bus Driver Appreciation Week. So if you see a bus driver, please thank them for getting our children to school safely. I also want to let the board and the community know that the month of October is National Principal Month and we honored our principals uh, last week. I honored each one of our principals uh, last week, so I just wanna let everyone know that the month of October is National Principal Month. As Mrs. Migliaccio said, we are in our fifth full week of school and everything continues to go well. The attendance average is consistently in the mid-90s for both full in-person and for our remote learners. So everyone's doing a, a great job. As everyone's aware, we did send out communication last Friday, just a reminder of our protocols that we have in place. And this evening, Assistant Superintendent Parsons will provide an update regarding students returning. And I wanna remind the community and the board that when we are making decisions regarding full in-person learning or remote or going to hybrid, we are looking at Hartford County, Farmington Valley, state of Connecticut data, and local Granby data. So we look at all the data and all the metrics when we're making those decisions. I'm very excited to report that our food service program is doing very well and that we are now, as you are aware, through a grant through the United States Department of, um, through the United States Department of Food Agriculture, thank you that we are offering any children under the age of 18 free breakfast and free lunch. And we are working on a program also to offer free breakfast at the high school. As I mentioned, Assistant Superintendent Parsons and I and our Director of Nursing, we meet with the Farmington Valley Health District and our medical advising team weekly to monitor all the metrics that are going on in the state of Connecticut. We are, this is interesting news for the board and for the community. We are awaiting word and permission from the Commissioner of Education and the Connecticut State Department of Education regarding uh, inclement weather days. So will we have school if we could do it remotely in case of inclement weather? So we're, we are waiting for guidelines from the Connecticut State Department of Education regarding inclement weather and giving local decisions up to superintendent of schools to have remote days rather than canceling school for inclement weather. So I will keep the board and the community at large apprised of any decisions. We did increase our attendance at athletic events from 100 to 150 
outside to meet the executive order by the governor. We are also allowing students to attend games if they have a pass from a player. The CIAC announced last week that there's a tentative schedule for winter sports with winter sports beginning in late November. We are still awaiting guidelines from the CIAC, specific guidelines regarding sports, and the CIAC will be meeting with the Connecticut Department of Public Health on Thursday. So I don't want to give out too much information because there's not much information to share. I want to congratulate Luke McFarland, the sing a senior at Granby Memorial High School, who is a semifinalist in the National Merit Scholarship Program, as well as a 2020-21 Hispanic Scholar for Excellence in Academic Achievement. Additionally, Aiden Goodrow, Chase McGee, and Colby Milbright seniors were recognized with a letter of commendation for outstanding performance on the PSAT National Merit Scholarship qualifying test in 2019. Something to be very proud of of our Granby Memorial High School students. FY22 budget is well underway. Site budgets are due on October 30th and meetings will, with administrators will begin in November. The next building committee meeting is tomorrow at 5.30 via Zoom. There will be no school on Tuesday, November 3rd, professional development and the professional development part of it will be focused on technology. Our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be Wednesday, November 4th. I also want to take some time to thank uh, several board members for every night they've been at meetings with me um, this week. So I want to thank the board for, again, the countless hours that you spend volunteering your time. At this time, I'll entertain any questions that you may have out of the superintendent's office. Thank you, Jordan. Um, can you just update us on the status of the support from the police department at the 189 exit and, and how that's going? Yes, so I've been working with the town manager and the chief of police to analyze the 189 section. And as of right now, our town engineer has gone out there and looked at, and I'm waiting for recommendations from the town manager, from the engineer. But in the meantime, the police department have been out there in the morning and in the afternoon as a, a tentative solution. Um, of where we are right now. So I'm just waiting word from the town manager on next steps. Um, uh, you answered my question about CIAC. Um, my, my question after a, a bit of messiness in August was, are they consulting with the Department of Public Health? Um, so it seems that they are um, when we start talking about our compressed winter sports season and um, appreciate the inclement weather. Um, Kind of sad that this might possibly be the end of snow days, um, but <laughs> completely um, understand. So we will eagerly await hearing back from you, um, presuming that they're going to leave it up to the local districts, depending on what their technology capacity is. So it will be a local call? Correct. That's okay. We're waiting for the guidelines to come out. The State Board of Education charged the Commissioner of Education and his staff to come out with guidelines for districts to follow before they approve anything. So okay. sooner than later, that's how I look at it. They have to make uh, that call. Yeah, and I, I expect we'll see that in policy committee at some point, if depending on what this comes down as. I don't think this would be a policy decision because the superintendent of schools is the one that would make decisions on whether we have school or, or not. It, it wouldn't be a policy. Okay. Thank Unless you. they say <laughs> you have to adopt a policy. So, yeah. But I wouldn't think that they would do that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments for Jordan? Jordan, I. Brandon? Oh, wait. Is this on? No. My question is Is there a predetermined, like, tipping point that Farmington Valley has as far as an infection rate, or is it more, we'll know it when we get there kind of scenario? That, that's a really good question, and we ask that question, and Jen and I ask it on a regular basis. As, I have, as we communicated in our letter to families, we've now gone on a 14-day average, so they're really looking, and I'll ask Jen to uh, chime in a little bit during her report because she's going to talk more about this, that they're really looking at the threshold of 10 to every 100,000, but they have to look at what we have 
within the, the Farmington Valley? And I believe last week, Jim, we were about a 2.6. A little bit higher than that last week. So the, the tipping point is they're going to let us know. <laughs> that, that's what they have said, that they will make the recommendation to us to say you need to pull back. Thank you. To that effect, um, we've seen, we're seeing spikes in uh, Bloomfield and across the state, East Hartford. Um, do we have plans to uh, you know, send out another letter to the public, um, you know, should cases get to X, here's the overview of the plan, like we'll switch to a hybrid model, and then if something gets to Y, we'll switch to full remote. Um, you know, n notification, if we hear on a Wednesday, we'll start the next phase on a Monday, that type of thing, just kind of an overview. So yeah. People so, are aware of yes. what to expect. So we will do that. In our communication last week, we put in there the different learning models, and it, it says in there, and when you click on the learning models, there's a chart that says when we would move to hybrid, when we would move to remote. What's happening around the state, and um, one large school district, Harford, is trying to get two weeks out and say, based upon the numbers that they have, so as much notification that we could give to families based upon the trends that we see in our weekly meetings, we will provide that notification. Jen has been working with the principals regarding their hybrid plans. If we need to move to a hybrid plan, we'll be communicating to families what that schedule may look like. The schedule would also affect the, the children that are remote learning um, too. Good question, thank you. Thanks, Brandon, and that question prompted me for a follow-up with Jen in her report, thank you. Uh, Sarah, is that a yes, that just last one? Yes, very quickly, is this on? Okay. Um, with the with almost five weeks of full in school behind us, um, have we seen any movement in numbers of students requesting to come back to in person class, or just the opposite? Are we seeing any people who are opting uh, for that remote learning? Jen's going to give you the exact oh, numbers okay. in her report. Perfect. <laughs> it was just let Jen go first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, if we want to talk COVID. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. All right, Jen, all eyes on you. <laughs> okay, great questions in terms of um, COVID cases and rates and things like that. So good, good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here at another Board of Education meeting in person. Um, as um, Dr. Uh, Grossman mentioned, to date, we have had zero cases in the Granby Public Schools. And that is something to really celebrate and be excited about. Um, and we reminded the community of that in the letter last week that went out. So when we're looking at cases, we are looking at Hartford County, the Farmington Valley Health District. We're looking at our town. We're looking at the state. Um, we consult with the Farmington Valley Health District. I think we've probably said this before, but um, Jordan and I have no less than three meetings a week with our representative from the Farmington Valley Health District in the state of Connecticut, Department of Public Health. Our nurse also has an additional meeting, and I am on the phone with our contact at the Farmington Valley Health District multiple times a day. So we're very well um, kept, we're kept informed very well. And the Farmington Valley Health District has a, an enormous level of information. They, know ex they speak directly to almost every single person who tests positive. And so they know how, why the person tested positive. They know how they contracted the virus. And that's where they have information that they, while keeping maintaining privacy, they can share trends with us. If they start to see that the cases aren't related within families, if they're not all members of a specific organization, and they start to see more community spread, unrelated cases, that's where they'll let us know we should be more concerned. So those are all different factors that play into it. But we really do look at um, those stated numbers of you know, moving into a hybrid would be around 10 cases per 100,000 and remote would be around 25 cases per 100,000. And right now we're looking um, primarily at the, the Farmington Valley. If our town was higher than the Farmington Valley or higher than Hartford County, we would really be looking at that as well. But right now the, the rise in Hartford County is really related to specific towns and Granby fortunately is not one of those. Um, so that being said, I did want to provide an update on our remote learners. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the year, we had about 16% of our students learning remotely. 
we do, um, we have encouraged families to think about their um, learning experience this year in terms of marking periods. So our elementary students are coming up on the end of their first trimester. So we were able to check in with each and every remote learning family um, at the elementary level. And we have 12 students who will be coming back in just a couple weeks. And we've also been having students come back to the L, uh, middle and high school along the way as we can accommodate schedules. So we ask you to think about a marking period, but we need a minimum of two weeks of school days to try to make accommodations if, if needed. So right now we have 200, once those students return, we'll be at 245 students out of our 1,723 at 14% of our students learning remotely. So we have seen a return of students to the schoolhouse environment. I was at the middle school today and I was happy to walk into an art class and I saw all of the seats were filled and there were students who I knew were learning remotely that were back that I was able to say hi to and welcome them back in person. Any questions on the COVID related matters before I keep going? Um, uh, that's good news, but if the seats are full, that also means um, more people in a, in a space. So just speak, I, I know we're paying attention to that, but just yeah. for the sake of the public, can you speak a little bit to how we're managing, um, you know, if, if everybody wanted yeah. to come back, could we accommodate it? Uh, how, how is that working out? How yeah. are we staying on top of that? We could absolutely accommodate everybody back in buildings because that's what we planned for for the year. So for the majority of our remote learners at the elementary and middle school, they're learning in classes that are fully remote. So those classrooms are still here for them when they return because we know that this option could sunset at any given time. Um, in our classes, when students return, we make sure that they're, we're still able to maintain the spacing that we've established. And if we can't, we would either need to um, reshuffle the class makeup or move the class to a larger space. Chad, I have a question. So when the evening news <laughs> says the infection rate is 2.7 percent, right? Like we just when the evening news says that the infection rate is 2.7 percent and you mentioned uh, 10 per 100,000 or 25 per 100,000, does that mean that the infection rate is 2.6% of the people that are getting tested, or is it 2.6% of the population of Farmington Valley or Connecticut? I believe what you're referring to is the positivity rate. So that's the number out of the number of tests taken, which is not a normative group, right? It's whoever goes for a test. Those would be symptomatic people, most likely. It right? could be symptomatic. Okay. It could be asymptomatic. There are a lot okay. of asymptomatic people also getting tested, but symptomatic people who want to rule out a runny nose from COVID. There's a lot of people testing right now. The testing rates are up, but 2.4% 2, 2 of those tests taken are coming back positive. That's the percentage that you're hearing. So in reality, the actual infection rate would arguably be lower, right? So, so Maybe. yes, of the total population, but we can't, we can't um, suppose that. We have to go based that. just on the testing. So yeah, yeah. if you hear that the positivity rate is a 2%, if there were 1,000 people, no, 100 people tested, two. two be, were positive right. and the other 98 were negative. Okay. So Dave, I think what you're asking um, is they extrapolate and then strap it to that 100,000 person. Right, if we give 10,000 tests and then we can multiply it times 10 and say that's the rate per 100,000. Right, so the yeah. rate per 100,000, which is the, the leading indicator we've been directed to use. We have supporting indicators of positivity rates as well as hospitalizations and flu and COVID-like illness. But the leading indicator per 100,000 is how many new cases per 100,000 people. So in Granby, if we only have 50,000 people and there's two new cases this week, then it's four per 100,000. So Jen, is it, so positivity is the percentage of tests that are positive. Prevalence is the percent in the po of the population that have tested positive. Two completely different metrics. So Correct. that the two that when we're looking at the once we get up to ten per hundred thousand, that's the prevalence in the community, right? That's different than the 
uh, positivity rate, two Correct. different metrics. Correct. Okay. And if you were to see that the look, there's a new system that was released with local towns, so now you can log into the state portal, and this is not in regards to schools. This is really just a, um, an emergency management system. So if you look at the maps, they're using that per 100,000 rate per town because it normalizes small towns versus larger towns. So you'll see that there's now a, a color ranking of towns um, that is available on the state website. Thank you. No problem. Other questions? I have one follow-up question. Sure. Um, tying on to Brandon's question. Um, this is a guess question. I know when we released our Stronger Together plan, the guidance was if our, we will go into hybrid if we tick up to that 10 cases per 100,000. Um, that is guidance from Farmington Valley or from DPH? It's actually the State Department of Education has issued the stronger to, uh, has issued the Adapt Advance Achieve plan with all of the addendums belong to the State Department of Education. Okay. They've consulted with the Department of Public Health on the creation of the materials. So that those metrics come from an addendum that the State Department of Education has published. So then this is where the guess part comes in. Um, if that is the S State Department of Education's document, they could probably change that at any time. They could say, you know what, we're not comfortable with 10 anymore. We want to change it to eight or six. They have made changes along the way. Okay. I have not heard any inklings of changing that document. It's based on research out of Harvard um, that the actual numbers. So I think that would sort of be a, a waterfall trickle down effect that if it was changed at a larger level, it could potentially be changed at the state level. Thanks. I, I think. I appreciate that because my we're all looking for certainty in a time when we can't be guaranteed any. And I know parents have asked, well, at what point do we go hybrid? And um, at what point do we shut down the schools? And, you know, repeating those numbers is helpful um, with the caveat that, you know, it could change at any time. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, operating in an environment of uncertainty, which um, most of us or none of us like to do, especially when it's our students and our, our staff. But thank you. As we stated in our letter, our goal is to keep our students fully in person as long as it is safe to do so. And that's the discussion that we have every day over and over again with our Farmington Valley Health District um, and really watching to see that while you do see that the news is scary and there's inaccuracies and they change the numbers and you're never quite sure exactly what to believe. But we are looking at the fact that yes, the state has risen. The Hartford County has risen, but the Farmington Valley is in a really good place right now, and we want to keep our kids in person as, as long as we can and as long as it's safe to do so. I just wanted to add on to the, the learning models quickly. Melissa, did you have another question? No. Okay. So just to address, Brandon, your question, um, one of the updates I wanted to share is that our principals have each been putting their finishing touches on their hybrid and remote learning plans. So those were laid out in the Stronger Together plans that are published on our website, but with um, a level of generality. But those are now really specific plans that we have based on the work we've done with technology, based on the feedback of our remote teachers. And we have a really solid plan for if we need to go into hybrid and remote. And principals have those letters ready to go when needed. So if we were to find out tonight that we needed to go into hybrid tomorrow, those letters are ready and the teachers are ready to follow up with specific communication to their students and families. We just don't want to share that at the level of detail until it's relevant to everybody. And we don't want any misconceptions, but those schedules are ready. They're ready to go. Teachers know what they are and teachers and students are carrying their technology back and forth every day. So they should be ready to go at a moment's notice. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other questions for Jen? Thanks for your work. No problem. Every day a new surprise, right? <laughs> all right, student representative reports. Jack and Jacob, let us know what's happening at Granby Memorial High School. I'm ex <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> I'm excited to report the new success of our uh, new free lunch program at the school. Due to the convenience of a free lunch, more and more students are coming to get lunch every day. And the lunch 
is getting exponentially better every day. Everything tastes amazing. And I would like to thank our lunch staff who are doing a great job keeping up with the very increased demand from the students for school lunches. I'm also happy to report that GMHS coffee house auditions for a fall coffee house are next week, all week long. So the music program has been doing a very, very, um, has been working very hard with Mr. Dunn to try and help um, continue music pro programs in the school. Uh, drama auditions for the fall play, It's a Wonderful Life, were this Monday and the first rehearsal was tonight. And application to the National Honor Society opened this week and applications for all qualified juniors and seniors are due tomorrow and they'll be reviewed in early November. Thank you. Jack? All right. Okay, I wanted to start off and talk about the, um, how the senior process is going for applying to college. We have a deadline of December 1st to uh, have all of our intake meetings done, which is where you talk to your guidance counselor about the schools you'll be applying to and make sure they have all the information and recommendations sent out at the same time you have your um, essays and resumes sent out. And the first deadlines were October 15th and then November 1st, and you have to apply or er, have your meeting 10 school days before, so a large majority of students have already had their intake meetings done. And all seniors received their SAT scores this past Friday, and um, I was not one of the five, but I'm very um, proud to announce that five students in my grade received a perfect score on the math SAT, which was very impressive. And then um, juniors and sophomores are awaiting their PSAT scores, which they took two weeks ago when we had a um, remote, seniors and freshmen had a remote day on a Wednesday. The freshmen will also be taking their PSAT this Wednesday. And then for sports, the girls field hockey team is hosting uh, Canton for their senior night right now. It started at seven. They have nine seniors that'll be graduating and they currently have a record of four and two. The boys' soccer team had their senior night last night and sadly lost to Suffield 1-0. They had 12 seniors and are currently 4-2-1. The girls' soccer team is 5-0 and, oh and had an away game tonight at Suffield at 7 o'clock. The volleyball team plays SMSA today. That was a day game. I did not find out the score before the meeting, and they are 6-0. and oh. And then the cross-country team is coming off a meet yesterday at East Granby, and they are 5-1 and one on the year. Wow. Um, most excited, excited about everything, but most excited about those perfect math scores. How many five did you say seniors? Okay. Um, Jacob, question for you. It's a wonderful life um, is the fall play. How will that, what are the plans for that to be actually performed um, in the current environment? So for the current environment and social distancing rules, we're trying to implement a kind of radio show where instead of having a traditional set and um, everyone moving around and being close together will instead have more of a talk show where it, the characters will be conversing like talk show hosts on stage. Um, there won't be much interaction between characters, but instead of a regular set, the set crew will be working to create sound effects, which is something totally new that we've never done before for a GMHS music performance. Very cool, so presuming um maybe family only in the auditorium and then available via Zoom? Yes, for both that and coffee house. Great, great. Other questions? All right, thank you both. Business manager's report, Anna. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> this evening, I'll be reporting the September um, um, 2020 Statement of Accounts. Um, it reflects a comprehensive forecast of the cost of reopening schools um, with the protocols and the materials um, that support the safe learning environment um, during the current pandemic. So the forecast, um, not only does it um, project the cost of reopening, but it's also shows the re, um, projected receipts for two grants, which we qualified for. Um, one is called the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. They call that ESSER. Um, and the uh, second one is the Co Coronavirus Relief Fund. So before the application of the grant funds, the general fund forecast is negative $723,000. 
Regular education is over budget, $640,000, and special education is over budget, $83,000. The major line items that cause the over budget condition are custodial and maintenance salaries, bus monitors, and general supplies for maintenance. That's basically the PPE and cleaning. The statement of accounts, though, has two columns to the right of the columns we typically provide that demonstrate the application of the grants. Um, the larger of the two grants, the Coronavirus Relief Fund grant, allows us to take actual expenditures up to December 30th and apply them to the grant. Um, and because of the date constraint, the general fund continues with a negative forecast of $124,000. Now, out of the $124,000 that we're projected to be over budget, $57,000 is, um, re is reflects regular education expenses, and $67,000 is projected um, to reflect special education expenses. Now, the regular education expenses that are projected to be over are basically the second half of the year that is not covered by um, the, the grants. Um, in quality and diversity, um, the original, the first look at quality and diversity um, um, forecasts to be, uh, expenses are a little bit um, lower than budgeted um, because of the change of our summer school program, which is typically funded from this account. However, we are not receiving revenues from that account, so the net savings is about $10,000. Um, as we go through the year, I expect that number to change based on um, the performance of other programs that we um, usually take um, out of that grant. The projection for revenues to the town continues to reflect additional revenue from regular tuition from other towns. Um, that has, that's pretty stable. Um, we'll be right on budget. Um, excess cost funding, which is the state portion of um, some special education expenses, is projected to be lower than budgeted. Um, projections for rental fees and pay for participation fees are uncertain at this time. However, our fall pay for participation fees are anticipated to be about $20,000. The revenue um, from building rentals remains uncertain at this time, and the overall projection for revenue to the towns is better um, than last month by uh, $9,000, but continues to be unfavorable. And so that's, um, that's um, September. Um, we're still very early in the year. Um, we've only, that's really our only first operating month, so we'll be keeping a very um, close eye on, on that. Thank you, Anna. Jenny, any comments or? Yeah, just briefly, the, we did go over this in some detail, um, and uh, uh, because there's a lot of moving parts, um, I guess the, my major um, message to the board would be that um, uh, that I think the administration is uh, being prudently prudently conservative in uh, forecasting um, what it could cost to keep the schools open all year, um, which we hope we could do, uh, which we want to do. And because of um, the great work that was done in securing especially the large grant um, uh, fortuitously and, and through good work and good luck, apparently cons uh, um, not all the school systems were on top of it. And um, you know, it puts us in a position where even if we are over budget, we are much less over budget than we would have otherwise been, and, and certainly um, well below what we were able to return to the town last year through the savings. Um, so we're keeping in close contact with the Board of Finance on this as the year plays out. Thanks, Jenny. Any questions for Jenny? Right. Um, did, you, did you say the 124000 could be covered in a grant for next year? Or? Which? Which 124? The projected over budget. Uh, n the n no, what um, the grants can only cover direct COVID-related expenses. The one we got has to can only cover expenses through December 31st. And so some of what's in here, for example, the custodial staff, if they're not paid till after December 31st, they can't be covered by the grant. So that's part of the overage. Um, obviously, there's a possibility of an additional grant 
But otherwise, if we end the year in a deficit position, we will be looking to the town to make us whole. Okay. Are these state or federal grants? The big one was a federal grant, right, um, Anna? They're both federal. They're both federal. They're both federal grants. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, my only comment would be, um, we tend to, this is, um, you know, we're only really 60 days into the budget year um, from July 1st, and um, our hope is that um, grant monies will continue to be made available, and also we tend to tighten up our projections as we creep closer um, to the end of our fiscal year, but um, appreciate the work. All right, uh, now to one of the most exciting parts of our night, schools in the spotlight. Welcome. Um, Taylor, I'll let you determine how this is going to be set up in a socially distanced manner, but we welcome um, teachers Leanne Sullivan and Tim Cody, um, our eighth grade science teachers. And when the students come down, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and, uh, when I call your name and so we can know who you are. Welcome. Taylor, where do you want the students to be, or teachers? Right here, okay. Uh -huh. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Where okay. would you like us? Um, okay. I'm thinking, so right maybe in the center so we can get a little more distance, or do we not have a microphone there? We don't have a microphone. All right, so here is good. Um, and so let me um, welcome Jasmine Burnham. Who, which one's Jasmine? Hi, Jasmine, welcome. Um, Ava Gallinelli. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Haley Mills. Hi. We, um, hello, Haley. And Isabella Ter Terrian? Therian. Yeah. Okay, welcome, guys. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, why don't you, you're going to present to us on how the garden grant is used during um, academic enrichment um, for science. Hello. Thank you uh, for inviting us here this evening. My name is Leanne Sullivan. Um, I'm a new science teacher at the middle school, and um, the young women you see before me are my eighth grade students. Um, I'm very proud of them. Um, I'm very proud of their efforts uh, in my own classroom and here this evening. Um, so we would like to first express our gratitude for the raised garden beds in our schoolyard and acknowledge those who work so diligently to see this project come to life, quite literally. Um, we really enjoyed our experience this fall. So um, my partner teacher, Tim Cody, couldn't be here today, um, but uh, I will start the presentation with words from him. if I can. <laughs> it works for my computer at home, so. Um, I, I can paraphrase, sorry. Um, so Mr. Cody um, is a botanist, really, and um, he has worked with in our uh, ag academic enrichment, which is our third um, period um, to plant, um, and he's really worked on planting just fall vegetables. Um, so he has an extensive history, 10 years I believe, um, with sustainable botany and working with both students and with um, without students in um, a gardening capacity and a farming capacity. And I'm not doing him justice, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but I will continue. Um, so this is a picture here of the beautiful gardens we have. Um, this year we've implemented, um, we added some um, artwork uh, in those uh, tile stones that you see on the ground um, and, and the, the plants um, that you see most close to, to the entrance are uh, perennials, they're um, in, uh, in effect uh, um, butterfly plants that we have, um, uh, we've planted to really create a native habitat. So, and then the, the raised beds, the three in the back are where Mr. Cody and his class have been planting. 
So um, my academic enrichment this year, I really focused on growth and development. And um, we started, um, we had, we really wanted to utilize this amazing space. And um, so you see Haley here um, and putting down some of the, the artistic um, tiles we created. Um, but we've, I really see this space as a, a, a multi-purposed uh, space with a, a lot of potential for um, modeling, exploratory learning, teaching across subject areas, and promoting engagement and stewardship of our outdoor spaces. So um, we've also, I've worked with the, the art teacher who supplied the beautiful tiles. We, um, they're all glass tiles um, that we created this year. Um, and my students themselves created local butterfly education guides. Um, I see this area, there, there's much potential for future cluster endeavors. Um, based on our students' interest, we've thought of um, using it for a schoolyard habitat uh, certification project working with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, we have ideas to use it as more of a sensory herb or tea garden. We think it might be a really important space for social, emotional, and uh, regulatory learning and more, more uh, restorative practices. Um, and it definitely has a lot of um, purpose in terms of interdisciplinary teaching. There are different community groups that have expressed interest and we've reached out to, to, um, to help us with our efforts. The two mainly are from the ground up and the Granby 4-H. So at this time, I'm going to um, have my, uh, my young women come and um, Bella will be first. She's going to talk to you about composting. Hi, I'm Bella and I'm gonna talk to you about how I composted, so basically, Basically, I helped make a compost bin, as you see there. Um, we put, are planning on putting like the scraps from the garden, like our weeds and stuff, so then they can come. I don't even, we put in like a bunch of stuff and it's like growing into like what we see in that top photo right there. Um, and also, so we had to weed a lot and like we weeded for like a few days. It took a long time, but it was definitely worth it for what we put in there. And we just had a lot of fun doing it. Like as the quote says, like we like to work with our hands and have a fun hands-on activity to do during school it was really interesting. And like, yeah. Thank you, Bella. So, do you want to, should we hold questions until everybody tells us a little bit? What sure. do you think, board? Okay. So Bella did not tell you, but she created our compost bin um, and, oh, you did. Um, but she was the one that took out the instructions and put it all together for us. Thank you. Haley. Hello. Hello, I'm Haley. Some things I really liked about academic enrichment this year are we've never had a class that's about us before. Another thing is that we have never had an experience in school that lets us go outside and explore new things. Also, some students are interested in the Granby 4-H group because they want to learn more about growing different types of plants or food in our school garden. Finally, I'd really hope that this Granby 4-H group gets involved with this project because I'm really interested of getting to grow food in our school garden. Thank you. Thank you. Ava, who's next? Hey, hi, I'm Ava, and I wrote the quote, I like being outside and doing some different things because this year is just like a weird year in general, and we're in our seats a lot most of the time, besides our mass breaks, and being able to like go outside and just kind of do some hands-on activities is just kind of like refreshing, and it's almost like an escape from COVID. 
And gardening and planting and what we're doing and being useful with the gardens outside can honestly help us in science class and in all of our classes. Like art, how we put the tiles out there, it's just kind of like a great use for all of the classes and be able to do some hands-on activities outside and just kind of get our minds away from COVID. Thank you. And then last but not least, welcome. Hi, I'm Jasmine. And this year, with academic enrichment, I learned about the monarch butterflies. Something I did not know about them is how much they have been threatened. This year, I learned that normally I would think that monarch butterflies just are simple butterflies that just fly around and yeah, uh, that they just fly around and move season to season. But this year, I learned that they actually need a lot more than they are getting from nor normally. And people that know about butterflies try and help them, but most people don't know how to help them. So I would like to show you guys how to help them. They need Mexican sunflowers, milkweed, uh, dwarf butterfly bushes, and Xena flowers. Okay, uh, monarch butterflies typically live for two to six weeks, but the last generation of the years liter uh, live up to eight to nine months, which is a long time for a butterfly. Thank you. Um, questions from the board? Um, I'm sure we have some. I see Ro. Hi. I have a couple. Um, ladies, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just so I can kind of understand the context that you started your gardens, was, was it a, a decision of the group to have, to, to have butterfly bushes and learn about butterflies, or was, was this something that the group came up with, or was it, uh, were there time constraints involved because of the time of the year that school started? I'll, I'll answer this. Um, there was time constraints, and um, we saw the area um, looking for a little love. So mm -hmm. we decided to um, to give it some love and give it a sense uh, some purpose. And um, so we we thought about. I spoke with Mr. Cody, and we thought about different ways we could utilize this space. Um, and so we planted. Uh, seeds. He planted seeds with his class, and um, I really wanted um, to see something that was a little bit further along in terms of maturity. So we planted um, butterfly bushes, and I, I really and plants, and uh, I really wanted to have our students explore. Um, it was a good way to start off our topic for the year: growth and development. Mm -hmm. In, in a multitude of ways. And um, we expressed, I shared with them, um, school, the idea of schoolyard habitats. And I see that, that there's a lot of room to, um, for us to, to um, follow that kind of thinking and practice. And um, I saw this as a great way to model the ideas around conservation. So, so I introduced the ideas of butterflies, but they were very helpful and supportive in my ideas. But um, third period academic enrichment really is a time for them to explore their interest and communicate um, what their interests are. But I did kind of jump start them in this one project. And they're perennials, right? Which means that, what, what does that mean? Oh, it, <laughs> go ahead. It means that they, if they go somewhere, they will come back after yeah. their season or the season changes where they went. So is this maybe something you can, in the springtime, you can check out and see if you see little yeah. plants growing up and how your if butterflies you are doing? If you see up on the top corner, mm -hmm. if you see any of like a caterpillar or a crystal, it means that one of those will become an adult butterfly. That's excellent. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Brandon? Were there, were there a lot of butterflies that we get? Or? 
We haven't seen any butterflies yet because they're not here, but like we've seen like a lot in like Granby, so we assume they'll come. One of my classes saw a yellow tail butterfly. We were very excited to see, but that was the only one we've seen. Um, we're excited to, to plant um, more, more plants that support the butterflies at each stage. They eat different things in the caterpillar stage and need different plants um, when they're eggs and adults. So we're, we started to explore that and we know what we can plant moving forward. Other questions? Oh, Brandon, more question? Uh, what kind of vegetables are we growing? We're like growing like fall time vegetables. So I think, I don't, our class didn't plant those, so I'm not that sure, but it, it's like just fall time vegetables that we can plant then. Like anything we could plant, we did. Who gets to Peas? take the vegetables? <laughs> We're thinking about like the FCS, taking them to like help them cook. Great. Other questions? I see Sarah. Is that Sarah? Yeah, yep. I just. I know I have the no, same I've fly, got over fly over here. Over here on me. Um, and I don't know who the appropriate person is to ask this question, if it's Mrs. Sullivan or the students or even Mr. Rye. But I know when I got my son's middle school schedule and I saw academic enrichment, that seemed to be new this year, and I wasn't sure what that was. Um, so. I'm learning now that it, it was indeed something that's a little bit new. Is it taking place of X block? Is it like a study hall? Haley kind of answered my question because I was wondering, is it student driven? Is it teacher driven? And Haley said, um, I really liked that it was about us. And I love that you said that because it sounds like it was very student centered. So Mr. Rye, I don't know, maybe if you are able to help me out with that. Yes, yeah, so uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I feel like it's, it's a typical Zoom qu uh, question you have to ask. But um, yeah, so um, academic enrichment this year actually evolved due to a need for a, um, a gap in our schedule. And what it came out is a student-centered, teacher-driven, um, almost like a passion project type of period in which it provided structure where students can, if they wanted to learn a new game such like chess, or if they wanted to learn something more in detail, such as monarch butterflies, or, um, and honestly, I've absolutely blown away by the, uh, the, the actual, the project that they've uh, taken on with the community gardens, because it was there. And unfortunately, with the change of regimes, and uh, it just seemed to have just, uh, it was there, and everyone just really took a hold of it and ran with it. So, um, so this has actually been a really beneficial um, time period in which a lot of kids have spoken very highly about that they're getting a lot of out of it because they're able to pursue passions or areas that they wouldn't necessarily have the time to pursue. And it's supported by the teachers, which has been amazing. I've, I've just found that um, the students in the beginning, especially after COVID and, and the summer, they really had, um, it was really challenging for them to return back to school. So it took them, it, it was nice to have a project such as this to get to know them and to kind of nurture them through um, just kind of coming out of their shells. So um, at this point, I feel um, that these ladies are ready to really explore and express themselves. But initially when, when um, the, school started and this block um, began as well, there, the students' voices were a little bit quieter and now as we're getting to know each other, um, their ideas are fully coming out. And so we have the, the rest of the year to explore all their interests. Thank you, other questions? Mark? I guess it's more of a uh compliment that'll lead into a question. So when you said it needed a lot of love, I actually noticed the garden when we did our facilities tour and I wondered what happened to it. It needed a lot of love, right? There's a lot of stuff that needed to be cleaned. So first of all, congratulations for whatever part you played in that. It was overgrown when I walked by. Yes, thank you. I think it was taller than Bella. <laughs> Say that again. I think I think the weeds were taller than Bella, and I have to tell you that these girls work so hard, and I didn't have 
all my students didn't work quite as hard, but these ladies have quite a work ethic and really their efforts, I'm glad you noticed that because their efforts really should be applauded. I'm amazed by, they never complained and um, they did everything that was asked of them. We brought out, we carried buckets out every day to um, water the garden because the, the hose situation wasn't working. So they've just gone above and beyond. So you guys were out obviously pulling weeds. Yeah, all right, good job. I got a big garden at my house if you're looking for practice in pulling weeds, by the way. Any other comments from the board? Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing more about the garden as it grows. Yes, thank you for inviting us. This was a nice experience for all of us. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Um, I promised one of the parents that I met that um, this is the time in the night um, when we would love to have you all stay for the rest of the board meeting, but you, we understand that these nights get late and you are not obligated to, and we thank you for coming. Um, moving along to public comment. Um, you're a member of the public and you want to address the board. Come on up to the microphone. Tell us what's on your mind and where you live. Um, I'm going to start with anyone in the audience who would like to make public comment and then we'll move to the Zoom um, participants. All right, going once in the live audience, um, we'll move to the Zoom audience um, for public comment. John, any, um, any member of the public on Zoom who wants to comment or you're not seeing any hands raised? All right, going once, going twice. All right, we will move along. Wait, oh, there's someone. We were trying to tell whether somebody was asking to unmute. Oh, there. The email, it's not the same. Sound quality is much better. Oh, great, thank you. Any other members of the public? Thank you, tech department, again, bringing us along in this process. Um, moving on to the consent agenda. Um, can I have a motion? Second, um, discussion. Um, I actually reviewed the minutes, and I see no um, changes or corrections. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Rosemary Weber abstains. The motion passes. Old business. There is no old business to report. New business. Draft revised Board of Education goals. Um, can I have a motion? Um, I'll move that the Granby Board of Education. I will move that the Granby Board of Education adopt the revised Board of Education goals as presented. Dave, okay, thank you, Dave. So discussion. Um, so I know everyone um, provided their comments and input um, to Linda and Jordan. Um, and can we pull up, um, is it possible for us to pull up the board goals on the screen or? Okay. So um, in revising our goals, um, there are one, two, three, six goals listed. Um, student learning and achievement, community engagement, safety and social emotional well-being, budget development and fiscal management, embracing diversity, and professional learning. Um, Jordan, if you want to offer comment on um, some of these um, in terms of you helping us prepare the draft in areas um, as a new superintendent um, where you see how, this, how the board goals inform what we do as a board. Sure, thank you, uh, Mrs. Migliaccio. That we did receive feedback from the, the board members and the majority of the feedback we put into the goals. There were some that it, it was conflict 
with, between uh, two board members, uh, uh, not conflict, but some people wanted a different word, so we just did the best that we could. What we do see there is with the six goals, it is broad enough for the board to have board goals, but all these board goals will, as we discussed in our retreat, will align with all the continuous improvement plans. As you saw the middle school and the high school at our last board meeting, their continuous improvement in school improvement plans and their goals will align with these goals. Next board meeting on November 4th, you'll be able to see the superintendent goals and the superintendent goals will be able to align with these goals. These goals also will help us, as we discussed at our retreat, in developing our next strategic plan and the work that Jen will be doing with developing the Granby Public Schools vision of a graduate. These six areas are very solid areas to guide the work that we need to do this year relative, as uh, Chair Migliaccio said, to student learning and achievement, community engagement, safety and social emotional well-being, which is so important, budget development and fiscal management as we are doing right now in developing a budget. A very strong uh, goal for us is embracing the diversity and really which has always been a goal of the Grammy Public Schools is professional learning. So we have six broad categories and goal areas that really will set forth for the work that we need to do this year. So everything that we will be doing, we should come back together as a board and say, does this align to our board goals? So I feel very comfortable as your superintendent to align my superintendent goals at our next meeting with these goals that you've set forth. So I thank you for that. Thanks. Um, any comments? I'll just start with one. Um, I I'm very pleased with how these goals came out. I do think, here's the English major in me coming out, I do think under the budget development and fiscal management, um, we might need to add um, in the last phrase and innovative investments. I think um, that might give the impression that the board is actually in some capacity allowed to invest money. Um, that's just how it struck me. Um, so I'm thinking that we should clarify that. Um, Invest, innovative investments in our students, um, I think would be appropriate, um, or, or staff. I don't want to get too crazy, but um, I do think, does, is anyone else seeing the concern that I have with that innovative investments? Um, I, I actually uh, thought about that because of that concern, uh, although in the context of what we do, I, I thought it was obvious. Um, but, you know, I. I uh, and innovative investments in education. Does that does that help make sure? Perfect. That that does because again, someone, these these goals are going to be our, our guiding principles. And um, I just when I see in innovative investments, I think of a hedge fund. Um, yeah. So <laughs> or or even innovative educational investments. I like that. Um, Anyone else? I don't want to wordsmith it too much. And again, the point apologies. was the, I, apologies I, I, for the English I, I, major. I like the point that it's not all about. Reducing costs. It's all. It's also about leveraging, you know, yep. uh, resources. And 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 I. Uh, but I, I think clarifying it makes sense. Okay. Any other comments on that? So I have as a as a correction. I have as a correction to this um, and innovation, innovative educational investments. Correct. Got it. Any other changes, comments? I, I just want to say I, I really um, I like the way these came out, and I um, I feel I, I like the embracing the diversity goal. I think is very strongly worded, um, but all of these m mean nothing un un until we cascade into the what does it mean and how are we going to do it. And so um, I'm excited to see how the scaffolding under this gets built. Thanks. Agreed. Um, other comments before we act on the motion with that correction as noted? All right. Seeing none, um, I will call for a vote on the motion for the Granby Education 
withdrawn the Board of Education goals. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, we have new board goals that passed unanimously. Thank you. All right, first reading of policy, of policy revised policy 6159 IEPs, Individualized Education Programs. Um, Sarah? Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, this was a policy I um, brought uh, at our last meeting, brought to your attention. All the changes is just a matter of changing the age um, from 21 to 22 in terms of uh, the, the IEP, and that was driven by a change in statute. Thank you. Um, so any questions for Sarah? Seeing none, this will move forward for its second and final reading at our next regular meeting. Miscellaneous board standing committee reports, finance, personnel, and facilities. Jenny? Me again, yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did meet um, and spent most of the time on the, on the finances which we already spoke about. Um, the food service program the, um, has already been mentioned. The numbers are very good. Um, uh, we also need to see how the dollars, how the cost of delivering this is comparing to the uh, reimbursement rate from the federal government. So it's being watched closely, and, and we'll have more information soon on that. Um, but it's moving uh, definitely um, a, a very positive move in the right direction. Um, uh, Jordan just mentioned to us that we, our, our nursing services are through a contract with the Farmington Valley Health, uh, Nursing Association, Health Services? Farmington Valley Nurses Association. Nurses Association, okay. Um, I knew that, but, and, uh, and that contract will be coming up for, uh, renewal, and so, um, obviously we've been... Uh, very pleased with their services, and we'll be uh, working for a smooth renewal there. Um, and uh, the uh, the only other uh, thing to mention is that we did talk about um, doing uh, some um, uh, earlier planning on uh, as we work on um, negotiating contracts in the future. We'll sort of at the end of each year we'll look ahead and put a schedule together. Uh, and we, we talked about um, uh, just being more proactive in, in uh, working with some of our uh, professional resources uh, because of the value that adds in the process. Thanks, Jenny. Any questions from the board? All right, other board-related reports. Crec or CABE? So we did have our uh, CREC meeting today. There is nothing really of note uh, um, except very brief legislative report, I was happy to hear that CABE and the other associations are starting to message um, um, for the next legislative session, and, and the message is just leave us alone. That, that instead of asking us to do more, support what we're already doing. So um, that's the first time I've heard that this early in the process, so I was happy to hear it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Granby Education Foundation. Uh, I did not make the meeting Monday. Jordan, I think you sat in. Is there anything to report? The, yes, I, I did attend that meeting on Monday night. And as I was mentioned at the last meeting, they're looking to recruit new membership and leadership positions. So they spoke about that. And then they're talking about winter and spring events. And I have a meeting tomorrow morning with, uh, or tomorrow afternoon with the president of the Granby Education Foundation with an idea that they have relative to putting a, a program together to benefit the schools. So I'm excited about that meeting tomorrow. Great, thank you. Calendar of events, um, mostly sporting events. And from what I heard, um, if you are not a family member or you have, don't have a pass, and then I heard kind of conflicting maybe information about 150 people. So how does that work? So um, each student on an athletic team, even if you have a sibling, each student on the team gets four passes. And they can give those to any person, whether it be their parents, a student in the school, any 
one they want. So every team has, and they're all labeled like field hockey or soccer. So the people that are handing them in know. So no event will really exceed the capacity we were planning for, but everyone has four. Okay, so that's that's the missing link. So the, the four tickets are for the crowd control to keep in compliance with the executive order on attendance, got it. So if you know a player and you want to see a game, I think Jack might be available to give away some tickets. I'm teasing, you have a family. <laughs> I was just going to say it was originally two and that's why the uh, capacity went up because now each student got two more. Um, great, and uh, of course. So we're not running concessions, are we? No. I know, I know last time the, uh, the young gentleman was talking about or doing some level of sports broadcasting. Is that available somewhere for some of the um, games? Or Yes. So I haven't really watched any of the live streams, but every single, at least soccer game, is live streamed. And I believe more than that, I think the field hockey and girls soccer is also live streamed. It's on GMHS Boosters on YouTube. And if, if you don't watch the live stream, every game is then saved to that YouTube channel. Yeah, great question. Um, Jordan, maybe we can look into getting that link added, if it's not already, to our district webpage? It is. Oh. It, the link is, if you go under athletics, um, there's a link right there to the all events. And as Jack said, you can watch the games live, like the field hockey game is probably just ending. That was live tonight, but you can watch it uh, taped. So if you just go on athletics for the community, it's right under there, athletics, and it says daily events. Great, thank you. Um, board member announcements. I will I emailed the board um, earlier in, was it a week, two weeks ago? Um, I just want to reiterate my thanks to this board, each and every member that I serve with um, in these extraordinary times. Um, we're all doing what's right for the students in the district and a special thanks to Sarah, Jenny, and Mark for their tireless um, work on um, the GEA negotiations. Um, and that's it. Thank you, board. Action items. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss a collective bargaining agreement. Second. All in uh, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously, and the board will now enter into executive session.